Hello, okay, so we've just crossed 100 participants, so let's get started. I'm Eric Brynjolfsson, and this is the Stanford Digital Economy Lunch Seminar. And it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce my uh, friend and, and recent colleague, Daron Asimoglu from MIT, where he's an institute professor, the highest honor there. Um, he uh, collects honors almost every week. Last week, uh, I had the pleasure of uh, introducing him at his, when he got the CME MSRI prize, one of his many other accolades. He's written a number of uh, highly influential books, uh, hundreds of widely cited papers, and I'm not going to even begin to, to list uh, any of those because we want to spend as much time as we can hearing from Daron. So Daron, uh, welcome. We look forward to uh, hearing you talk about uh, the post-COVID world. Welcome, Daron. Thank you, Eric. It's my pleasure. And uh, uh, I'm glad we are color-coded here with white shirts. That's right. Uh, oh, you know what? I forgot one thing I'm supposed to do also, Daron, is just Anybody who would like to add questions, um, please use the Q&A function and I will be monitoring those. We'll have about 15 or 20 minutes at the end for general discussion, but if there's a burning you know, clarification question, I'll, I may pass that on as well. But uh, take it away, Jerome. And- uh, Thank you. Well, I'm gonna share my screen and, and get started. So, but let me start by saying that it's a true pleasure to be joining you all, albeit remotely. Uh, and I would like to talk about 35, 40 minutes so that we have plenty of time for discussion and Q&A because I'm very keen on hearing people's perspectives and reactions. What I want to argue is that we, the post-COVID world is due for a remaking, which I think is becoming more of an accepted position in uh, in policy and, uh, and, 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 and academic debates, but I want to put a somewhat different emphasis on some of this. In particular, I want to argue by, I want to start by arguing that not all was well before COVID. And in particular exhibit one in that is the situation of labor demand out of which many of the other ills of the US society and economy, I think, originate. So here what I'm showing you is how private sector labor demand has evolved in the post-war period. Uh, on the left, I'm showing the growth of private sector wage bill, total payments from the private sector to labor. And what you see is a really remarkable picture it shows a very steady and very fast increase in the willingness of the private sector to make higher and higher payments to labor, uh, either in the form of higher wages or in the form of more workers and in practice both. This growth corresponds to about two and a half percentage points faster growth in real terms than population. So to the extent that employment to population ratio roughly remained constant, in practice it's increased a little bit, but to the extent that it remained roughly constant, that would translate to two and a half percent growth of real wages in the four decades following World War II. But on the right, you see a sea change. The wage bill growth of the private sector first slows down and then almost entirely flattens out from 1999 onward. The private sector is not willing to pay and is not paying much more to labor today than it did essentially 20 years ago. This has had many sweeping implications for the US labor market. For one, it is intimately linked to why wage and productivity growth have decoupled and the labor share of national income has fallen quite rapidly over the last two decades. But second, perhaps even more importantly in some sense, it is related to the major transformative changes in the US wage structure, which I'm showing in this figure. This picture depicts the evolution of the cumulative real wages for 10 demographic groups, men and women, and ten, uh, five education groups going all the way from the dark blue, workers with postgraduate degrees, all the way down to the red, workers without a high school degree. And there are a couple of interesting pictures in this, uh, patterns in this picture that are worth emphasizing. First, you see that 
in the decades that followed World War II all the way up to mid or late 1970s, we had a period of relatively shared prosperity. All 10 demographic groups have real wages that follow each other very closely. And you, know, you won't find it surprising in light of what I said that essentially this corresponds to an about a two and a half percent, just under two and a half percentage real growth in wages for these groups. But then sometime in the late 1970s and early 1980 or around 1980, you have, a, you have three major related changes. First, you see that starting from here, these curves are opening up, fanning out, corresponding to a major change in wage inequality. The gap between the top earners, for example, workers with postgraduate degrees and those with less qualifications, both among men and women, is increasing quite a bit. Second, median wages are more or less stagnant. You can see that, for example, by looking at college graduate, but no postgraduate degree men, the light blue curve here, which has relatively small wage gains from the late 1970s to today. And almost as a corollary of these first two, you also have that the real wages of low education men is actually declining quite significantly during this era. These changes in the wage structure, of course, have various consequences. And some of them have been very damaging, including those that have led to greater social strife and political reaction as a result of the discontent that this period of stagnant wages or wage losses for certain groups have involved. Now, I said that this is intimately linked to the slowdown of labor demand. Why do I say that? Well, to understand the common causes of both of them, we need to look at what has happened to the various factors that determine labor demand. But I think a good way of uh, broaching that subject is to look at some of the international trends because US is not an island. So many of the changes that are impacting US in different forms, importantly in very distinct forms, but in some form are impacting other countries as well. Inequality is not just a US problem. Here, I'm looking at an omnibus measure of inequality, the Gini coefficient. And you see that US started out essentially the most unequal country in the mid 1980s within the OECD and has had essentially the largest increase in inequality, but many other countries have moved in the same direction. So there are forces that have been leading to greater inequality that are common across the industrialized nation. Though it is also important to note that one aspect of this is very specific to the US. This decline in real wages at the bottom is not shared by most other countries. There's a little bit of it in the UK, a little bit of it in Germany, but nothing like the US. Jerome, can I just already a little clarification? I, I, I love both these charts and, and, and going back to the one with the, the, the fanning out inequality and that's, you know, the root of a lot of what's going on. Um, it's nice to control for, for education, but also over this time, more people have become educated. So some people are moving from one of the lines to the other line or the population is. How much of a difference, if any, does that make in the story? So it doesn't that make all that much difference. And one way of seeing that is you could look at what's gone on with median wages in the entire distribution. And median wages are very, very anemic to say the least. So this isn't just a composition effect hiding healthy growth when you do composition adjusted. Right, the median worker probably has even less education than is less than college educated. So you're almost generous in, in, in picking that line. Right. 
Right, exactly. But the median itself is not subject to the composition effect. Because right. we're not looking, you're not conditioning on something that changes. But, but it's important, Eric, as you pointed out, that this red trend here is unique, almost unique to the US. And that, again, I'm going to come back to that issue because labor market institutions and norms are going to important, are going to play an important role. Another aspect that's going to play an important role in the explanation and in the remaking proposals that I will make is the nature of this inequality. And I'm going to link that to automation. But before I go there, just a quick peek at where the lack of job creation has come from already gives us some clues about that. And in this picture, I'm showing you that there is another aspect that is shared across pretty much all OECD economies, which is that there has been essentially no job gains and often job losses in the middle class occupations, those in the middle of the income distribution. Those are blue collar jobs, clerical jobs, back office jobs, some sales and retail jobs as shown in red. And you see that in all of these countries, the red bars are below zero, meaning that relatively speaking, that group of occupations have been re uh, retracting, losing ground in all of these countries. And in fact, that is the reason why I want to argue that in order to make sense of these phenomena, we have to think about globalization, we have to think about institutions, we have to think about technology, but most importantly, we have to think about the composition of technology. Economists have made great progress in thinking about technology and its implications over the ages, but much of that work thinks about technology as something that A, has a lot of commonality, for example, in increasing productivity and through either a trickle down or some productivity effect improves the conditions for workers. But reality is more complex. There are many different types of technologies and putting them into the single bundle of technology is not particularly useful. And in particular, automation, which corresponds to machines and algorithms substituting for tasks previously performed by labor is a very different type of technological progress than something that improves, improve, improves industry productivity or improves worker productivity, or most importantly, I would argue, creates new opportunities and new tasks for work. Automation is not a new phenomenon. It has been with us ever since uh, production processes have started, but it has also been especially important since the British Industrial Revolution's initiation when textile machinery and spinning and weaving were at the forefront of the technologies that revolutionized production and society in Britain. But that sort of automation technology needs to be separated from others. And here, based on my work with Pasquale Restrepo, I'm giving you one way of contextualizing and understanding that. So what we are doing is separate different types of technologies in terms of what they imply for labor share and labor demand. And the black line here is, sorry, the, the, the dashed line here is the automation technologies that create displacement push workers out of the tasks that they used to perform. Whereas the black line here is what we call reinstatement, technologies that create new opportunities for labor and increase labor demand via that channel. So in the four decades that followed World War II, somehow miraculously perhaps, although if we have time in the discussion, I'll explain why I don't think that was miraculous, but almost miraculously, the black and the dashed lines are highly balanced. They are counterbalancing each other so much so that the sum of the two, the, the shown in the middle with a thick blue line is hovering around zero. And that's essentially the reason why wages track productivity. But now fast forward to the more recent 30 year period where we see the labor demand slow down 
and wages and productivity decouple, now you see that displacement is going faster and reinstatement is going much slower. So there is a much more unbalanced portfolio of technological changes. And as a result, the sum of the two effects, the thick line, thick blue line in the middle is now heading south. And that is to a first order, the explanation for the decoupling between productivity and wage. So uh, Daro, we do have a question from, from uh, Moshe Vardy, we've got a couple of questions, but um, that is directly on this. Um, Moshe asks, does displacement happen at the low and middle scale part of the spectrum while reinstatement happens at the high scale? And can that explain the, the earlier chart? That's a great question. It's a little bit more detailed than I, would, I was intending to get into, so I don't have the chart for it, but it's actually a very interesting pattern. What Pasquale and I find in a different paper is that during this period here, Displacement was harming low skill workers. It was associated with a decrease in the demand for low skill workers. And reinstatement was actually helping low skill workers. So many of the new tasks and new opportunities went to increasing demand for non -product, for production work and work for low skill demand within the industries in which they took However, in the more recent 30 year period, you have the double whammy. Both automation hurts low skill workers, but reinstatement, although slower, we also find is associated with more tasks for high skill workers and it also increases the demand for skill. I'm happy to talk more about this in a second. Well, as long as you're on that topic, let me just quickly uh, follow up uh, with a question by, by Matt Bean who asks about um, whether the middle third is also dropping in China and some of the international aspects of it. And it, it's probably beyond what you wanna get into right now, but that raises the issue of, of globalization as another force affecting these trends. Great question. I do not know the answer to that. My, my guess is that China is going to have different dynamics because of still buoyant export demand. But we can get into that. Now, this picture here is somewhat abstract because it combines many different technologies across many different industries, but let's try to put some more flesh on the bone and look at a quintessential example of modern automation technology, industrial robots. Robots from their initial inception and design in the 1980s were imagined as automation technologies. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, they have had that effect. They've been a transformative technology for many industries, electronics, chemicals, and automobiles among them. And we find, and other people find, they have increased productivity quite significantly. So if you have the sort of all technology is good for labor view, and you don't wanna join me in thinking about different technologies with very different implications, you should expect that robots should be associated with more employment, more wage growth in places where they hit harder. But in fact, in other work with Pasquale, we have found quite the opposite. In labor markets, local labor markets that have introduced more robots, you have much worse outcomes for labor, especially production workers, and especially for wages. Although here, I'm just for brevity, I'm showing you the employment effects of robots. And you see this at the level of 722 commuting zones. And I'm pointing out these observations here, not because they drive their relationship. Actually, if you leave them out, the slope of the line hardly budges, but because they are emblematic of what's going on here. These are places at the industrial heartland of the United States, Detroit, Toledo, Cleveland, Beaumont, and they have really changed their production structure quite radically because of robots and automation, but as a result, also employment has declined and especially in production tasks. Now, AI arguably is going to be much more important for the future than robots. After all, industrial robots strictly defined are for industrial production workers, and there's less than 5% of the US population in those tasks at the moment. And AI, 
could be very different because AI is a broad platform and it can be used very fruitfully for creating many new products, many new applications, many new opportunities. But in practice, it seems we find in recent work with Joe Hazel, Pasquale Restrepo, David Otter, and myself, that AI adoption has also gone just like robots in the, uh, in the direction of displacing workers and automation. And this, I actually don't find surprising, and I'm going to come back to it, because if you look at where AI technologies are originating at the moment, they are in a small set of big tech companies whose business model centers on automation. One way of looking at that is to see which are the establishments that are adopting AI. And, uh, and we do that in, in this paper, and I'm showing you a summary of that using three different measures of which are the tasks that could be performed by either AI or machine learning. Uh, one is based on work by Felton et al. One is by, was work, by work by Eric, Daniel Rock, and Tom Mitchell, SML suitability for machine learning index in the second uh, panel. And the, the third one by Michael Webb. And we project these to establishments so that we're looking at which are the establishments that have more tasks that can be performed by AI, that can be replaced by AI. And these pictures show two interesting patterns. One is that, as I pointed out, AI is a very recent phenomenon. You see the takeoff in AI in vacancies, for example, for AI workers really come around 2015. So still a trivial fraction of establishments are really into AI in big way, but it is growing exponentially. And presumably in the next decade, we're gonna see much more of it. But more interestingly for my purposes here, we see that it is almost entirely establishments in the fourth or the third quartile of the distribution of respect, replaceable tasks by AI that are leading all of these things. So there's much less AI that is for you know, any adoption or uh, adopted by establishments that now weren't doing anything that was replaceable by AI. But even more relevant in this context is what do these establishments do once they adopt AI? And what we find there with the same color coding with the three measures is that those third and fourth quartiles are now having much slower job growth and hiring growth relative to other establishments. And we do this in the paper in a much greater, more granular level, but this already tells the story at this high quartile level uh, comparison. In other words, AI seems to be going in the direction of when it's adopted more, it is automating tasks and reducing labor demand at the establishment level. Now, all of this raises the question of why this bias towards automation? <clears throat> well, you might say, well, perhaps this is what technology wants. This is the normal direction of technology. I actually don't think so. And I'll come back to that in two, from two different angles. First of all, there are obvious reasons why we have started going all in on automation. Four of those are important, but I'm not going to have time to talk about the fourth one because I'll come back to that later in a second. But global competition has been very important. In particular, uh, cost competition from imports and other things have made companies look more and more for ways of cutting costs, and that meant often cutting labor costs, and automation is one way of doing that. As I've already emphasized, the business models of big tech companies whose size and influence on the direction of technology has been growing is very much based on automation. One way of seeing that is today, Google, for example, or for that matter, Facebook, uh, accounts for a larger fraction of the US corporate value than GM did at its peak. But when there's GM employed more than a million workers at the time, you know, Google or close to a million workers at the time, Google employs 80,000 workers. So it's a very, very non-labor based value creation. And therefore the business models of these companies that are leading the direction of technological change thus naturally stays away from 
using technology for creating new tasks, new opportunities for labor, especially low skill labor. And then finally, tax code. We have been modifying our tax code in a way that encourages automation beyond what is optimal. The US tax code has never been favorable to labor. So I show here, based on work that I did with Pascual Restrepo, Andrea Manera, the marginal tax rate, average marginal tax rate on labor and different types of equipment, different kinds of capital equipment, software, and structure. Labor is taxed always around for 25%. And if you add healthcare expenses and other fringe benefits, this actually increases over 30%. But capital has always been taxed less. In the 1990s, there was five to 10% difference advantage for capital. But since 2000, the capital tax rates have been falling after the Trump tax cuts, especially software and equipment now face very, very low tax rates. So most companies would save money even if they introduced non-productive, non-cost effective automation technologies and replace workers because they're getting an effective subsidy, implicit subsidy from the government. Now, can I ask a, on that? Yes. First off, I'm not sure I understood your last point. Um, the tax rate is still positive, so I'm not sure where. where but you, you know, go. when you when you replace workers, oh, when you shift from one to the other, I see. So instead of by a machine, you are trading 25 or 30 percent tax rate for the five percent tax rate. Gotcha. And uh, this relates to a question, or the, a question by Andrew von Neufeld. Uh, one thing you didn't mention was. Uh, uh, labor market um, institutions like uh, stronger unions or perhaps uh, minimum wage, uh, do, would those be on your list or is there a reason they're not on your list? They are not on my list for the following reason that they will, they do play a role, but their role is much more mixed. So minimum wages, for example, again, this is something we can talk more in the context of the policy discussion, which I will start in a second but also leave to some of it to Q&A. Minimum wages, for example, if they push labor costs will encourage automation, but unions are more complex because unions negotiate both on technology and wages at the same time. So exactly how that negotiation goes would matter. So there is evidence that some unions, especially when conflictual, they encourage automation, but when less conflictual, they might actually uh, be part of a bundle of adjustments where automation takes place, but in a way that is less damaging to labor. So it's a more complex picture with labor market institutions. I think the other aspect of institutions that I would like to emphasize, I'll come back to it, is you know, shareholder values versus stakeholder values and how research uh, support by the government and uh, shepherding of the corporate strategies by the government works. And I think those are some of the things I'm going to come back to in a second. Great. Now, before I get there, uh, and in fact, I'm, I'm going to end in about 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes, so we'll have plenty of time for discussion. So <clears throat> the causes, potential causes for excessive automation I listed in the previous slide are not the only reasons for suspecting that the automation we observe is excessive. The argument that we are going after automation and using AI for automation primarily is based on two implicit premises, neither of which are borne out by the data. One is that this is the natural path of technology. And second, that we are getting a lot of productivity benefits from this technology. As I said, the first one is far from the truth because at every stage, when it comes to technology, there are social choices. The way that we are using AI is neither the only one nor actually the one that many leaders of the AI technologies in the 60s envisaged. So it is a particular corporate and academic choice that you know, 
thousands of the smartest people in uh, in the United States are going into AI with a view of reaching human parity in as many dimensions as possible as a way of essentially replacing humans. And, but it is also not true that we're getting great dividends from this. So the standard measure that economists use for understanding the health of economy, especially as it comes from technological progress, is a total factor of productivity, which looks at how proactively our capital investments and labor are being used. So these data from Gordon, for example, show that the private business sector in the US was generating as high as 3% per annum TFP growth in the 1950s and close to 2% in the 40s and the 60s. Today, we have an explosion of new products, explosion of widgets and explosion of patents. But despite that, we are working very hard to reach half a percent TFP growth. We can talk about to what extent things are worse measured today than in the past. I don't think there is much evidence that the mismeasurement problem has gotten worse. But whatever you do, this is a very embarrassing problem for the American economy and our technological future. And I think in my mind, it is inseparable from how we are using technology in what directions we are going with the technology. The post COVID world is not only an opportunity for us to rethink these things because big shocks always have a way of creating a rethink of our cherished and often implicitly held notions, but also many of these problems are being made much worse. The evidence from 10K and 10Q filings and other reports is that many companies have accelerated their automation investments. Many of the jobs that were the last refuge of low skill workers, such as in the hospitality sector have disappeared. Many of them may not come back. So there is every expectation that the post COVID world is going to make these problems more severe. But I maintain that there is nothing natural about these developments, either before COVID or in the post COVID era. Of course, we depend on digital technologies and we are even depending on them even more today, for example, technologies such as remote work, Zoom and so on. But many of the most useful uses of these technologies are actually not automating. Zoom is a, not an automation technology. It's actually a human augmenting technology. It's enabling us humans to engage in better exchange of ideas, better production, better collaboration. So it is critical how we use these technologies and the path towards more and more automation is not inevitable. So again, I come back to the same thing that I started with the direction of technology is a choice. But critically, it is not just a choice of companies. It is a social choice, it's a governmental choice, it's a choice we make via norms and institutions as well as by corporate strategy. So therefore, it is inseparable from regulation of technology. Economists somehow take it for granted that technology <clears throat> is something associated with entrepreneurship, genius, science. So it's not something where the domain of regulation is most directly applicable, but I think that's wrong. Technology choices have always been social choices. Government has always played an important role. Norms and societal priorities have always played an important role, but often in ad hoc ways. For instance, during World War II, in the run up to it and in its aftermath, the government played a deciding role in both some military technologies and non-military technologies, including antibiotics, sensors, the internet, and all sorts of aerospace technologies. The transition to renewable energy <coughs> has been amazingly successful, despite the fact that we are still more likely than not to fry the planet by four degrees in the next two decades, three decades. But, but we've, had, we've had tremendous progress in renewable energy. And again, this wasn't 
some unregulated choice of technology, but it was regulation via institutions, government policies, subsidies, in some places, carbon taxes, but also importantly by social norms. Society's preferences transmitted to corporations by their employees and by their customers played a very important role in that renewable technology transition that has brought renewable energy to essential cost effectiveness with fossil fuel-based technology. But in fact, these examples are in some sense exceptions because they have happened in an ad hoc manner because they have not been in the context of an institutional framework to guide us. So my argument is that we need a much more systematic framework to guide us. And that is in fact a necessity because I think our notion of what inclusive institutions are in the age of robotics and AI also needs some rethink. In Why Nations Fail, James Robinson and I define inclusive institutions as those that create incentives and opportunities for a broad cross section of people. And our book written in the late, 19, uh, to, uh, late, late, late 2000s, early 2010s was somewhat backward looking, uh, inspired by history. And throughout history, the main barrier to inclusivity was excessive powers of elites often exercised via coercion control of key assets. But the future of extractive institutions or failure of inclusivity may be very different. The labor market is where most people have access to opportunities. Redistribution though central is never the primary way in which most people make their earnings or find their social role. It's a complement to labor market. So if pervasive and I would argue excessive automation create a two-tiered society where labor market opportunities are open only to those with very specialized skills such as those with postgraduate degrees and the rest are replaceable by machines uh, in low, less socially meaningful, less status building, less career building jobs, that would be a big failure of inclusivity. So all of those requires, again, that we really need to rethink regulation of technology and institutional framework for regulation of technology. So in some sense, what you might say is that what I'm arguing is a revamped welfare state, new responsibilities for the state, for combating inequality, as well as climate change and pandemics, of course, but with regulation of technology as its center. So society and government, not just a handful of AI researchers and AI companies should have a say on where the direction of future technology goes, who it impacts, who the winners and who the losers are. But looked at it this way, this is a major intervention in the workings of the market economy. So it comes with many risks. In particular, how can you keep the state under control? This was a critical question for many in the age of welfare state 1.0, for example, when Beveridge, Lord Beveridge published his epochal report in the middle of World War II in 1942, which advocated essentially for what became the blueprint for the wealth post-war welfare state in Europe, minimum wages, uh, progressive taxation, social security, national health service, aid to families with dependent children, and so on. So many people worried about that. And one of them was this very famous emigre from Austria with totalitarianism in his mind and Hayek saw a new totalitarianism, a second road to serfdom emerging from the government's intervention. At the end, <clears throat> Hayek turned out to be wrong. And the more recent book that James Robinson and I wrote, and this is my last slide, the narrow corridor is essentially a framework for thinking about this. Now, in 30 seconds, the framework of that book can be summarized with this picture. State society relations, democratic institutions, inclusive institutions all depend, we argue, on the balance of power between state and elites and the ability of society in the form of collective action, democratic institutions, media and other ways of resisting state and elite power. And that balance is important. When that balance is not in place, you have either weakness or disappearance of state institutions, state capacity or despotic dynamics. But things are different within this corridor here, which gives its name to the book, when we have a balance between state and society's capabilities. 
And what these arrows within the uh, within the corridor indicate is that the dynamics are very different, and that's what the Red Queen name refers to. This is the place where state and society both run together, as in Lewis and uh, uh, Lewis Carroll's Alice in the Wonderland, because they're trying to keep up with each other. It's competition and cooperation between state and society. And in some sense, Hayek's concerns can be understood. He was afraid that there would be a situation of imbalance, just like this trajectory shows. Civil society getting weaker and weaker, and states becoming more and more despotic because we had put more responsibilities and more powers in the hands of the state. But there's a different possibility, and that's actually the one that I think approximates better what happened in most of the industrialized world. As we put more responsibilities on the shoulders of the state, society becomes more capable, more, more uh, <clears throat> involved and better able to monitor states and elites, bureaucrats and politicians. And it is the reason why I think democracy actually not just continued, but it actually functioned better in the post-war period than before World War II. So in my vision, therefore, it is possible with the right institutional guardrails to make sure that we have our cake and eat it too, build better institutions for the regulation of technology, which I see as critical for remaking the post-COVID world, not just redistribution, not just uh, re, uh, better labor market institutions, but really redirecting technological change, redesigning AI. But that has to go hand in hand with political changes, especially in political culture participation. Put differently, we have to prove Hayek wrong again. Thank you. Let me stop here and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thanks, Aron. That was uh, amazing. Uh, certainly uh, some things to worry about, also some cause for optimism. Uh, on that last chart, before we, we have over 20 questions, so I want to get to those. But that last chart, um, it looks unstable the way you drew it, that if you veer off the path that you're in trouble, is it is it hopeless if you get off the path or is there hope to getting back? At, well, so our view, Jim, and my view uh, in the book and in some of the articles we wrote, although theoretical, not really sort of empirically, structurally, or whatever estimated, is that it's both. <clears throat> it's a model with multiple steady states. So each steady state has its own basin of attraction. So within that basin of attraction, you have an area of stability, but the narrow objective there is to highlight that the basin of attraction of the happy steady state where democracy, liberty, political participation coexist is narrow. So yes, mistakes and big shocks can destabilize it. It is a precarious balance. And so that makes it prescriptive to some extent as well, and that we need to heed that. It is part of the reason why I don't think you can be sanguine that, for example, the increase in right-wing authoritarian populism all around the world is not self-correcting, nor is it likely to be benign. Not that that requires any reminding to people, hopefully in the post-COVID world, when five of the most, the greatest number of deaths in among the, the top six are led by right-wing populist authoritarian governments in Brazil, India, US under Donald Trump, Turkey, and Russia. So the cost so of let me, uh, state capacity erosions are really high and not self-correcting in any way. So Donald Trump is not president anymore. So there's a question, one of the many questions is, do uh, Biden's tax law changes move us more towards a degree of rebalance and, and increasing minimum wage also counterbalance some of these, uh, these forces? Yes, I absolutely believe so, and uh, and but 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 only small uh, steps. Uh, I think the most, from my very very limited and very uh, partial vantage point, uh, there are some very important policy proposals that Biden is making, and the most important one is the global minimum tax on capital on corporate income, because. The only way that you can reverse that trend that I showed you towards lower and lower taxation on of corporate income is international cooperation. Part of the reason why corporate incomes have been taxed less and less is because capital has a great bargaining power of saying, well, I can go to another country, I can go to Ireland, I can go to Cayman Islands, I can go to Netherlands, I can go to Switzerland. 
And it is really a remarkable picture. As I said, but I didn't show you the data, but the share of capital in national income has increased from around 33% to over 40%. But in 1950, about a third of all US tax revenue came from corporate income. That number is close to zero today. It's really trivial, less than 5%. So corporate income taxes are extremely low. And I think the only way to reverse that is to international cooperation, something like the global, uh, global income tax. And, uh, and so you have to really work at both the extensive and the intensive margin, meaning that you have to increase corporate income taxes, but you also have to make sure that the, the even more importantly, in my opinion, and less distortionally, you have to broaden which companies pay corporate income tax. Many companies in the US because of their S corporations or private partnerships, or because they have other ways of writing off obligations don't pay any corporate income tax. Well, there seems to be support for your, your uh, policies, not just in the Biden administration, but, but more broadly. Um, Jake Easter asks, um, is there a way to regulate technology without uh, stifling, stifling innovation in technology? So. Does, does this, would this lead to less technological innovation overall if we do this? I think that is a concern and we have to be very cognizant of it. So we have to tread carefully. Uh, and that's why I believe an institutional framework specifying how to do this, what are the guardrails, what are the red lines? I think that's very important. But I think there is nothing in its nature that regulation of technology should retard technological progress. So by my definition of regulation of technology, US government's leadership in antibiotics, in space technologies, in computer technologies, often for war purposes by, led by the DOD, uh, was regulation of technology and it actually triggered not retarded technological change, nor did uh, support for green technologies and carbon taxes and support and, and social pressures <clears throat> retard technological change in the energy sector. Probably they actually accelerated it because uh, gas guzzler and fossil fuel, fuel based technological mm -hmm. technologies were already probably at near saturation. So more effort going into the less, uh, less trodden areas of wind, solar, geothermal, energy storage and carbon capture, I think were actually overall a gain for overall technological change. But again, we need a framework for judging all of these things. In some of those, the government directly invested, especially some of the, the bio ones you mentioned earlier, you see a, a role for direct government investment in technology? And yes, I definitely do, but you know, it's a chicken and egg problem. You know, when you think of space and uh, internet technologies, you know, you can't separate that from John von Neumann, the Manhattan Project, you know, brilliant researchers like Lawrence, Oppenheimer, et cetera. You know, these were like the leading researchers who rallied around certain causes, some of them perhaps misguided, such as nuclear weapons, but they did work for the government. So if you don't have the right capacity of the government, especially in terms of the human resources, you can't do that. And right now, that's what I mean by the chicken and egg problem, because we've become beholden to a view that government should stay out of it. You know, we don't have experts on AI in the government sector who are comparable to, you know, in terms of their education and their standing to those who are at Facebook or Google or Netflix. So we need to sort of increase that capacity. But once that capacity is increased, yes, I believe that the government has to become more of an equal partner to the private sector in some of these decisions, because not because the government should choose which technology trying to do the same thing is better, but the government together with society at large must have a say in what broad direction technological change will go, because that's going to determine who the winners and who the losers are. Um, what about uh, job reskilling and training? And so this is from Reke Kamath. What about job reskilling and education, making uh, labor and automation more productive and equitable? What are the roles there? Well, I, I, uh, I mean, obviously, it's like, you know, vanilla ice cream. Who can object to education and 
job training. But not professors. <laughs> but 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 I don't emphasize it for a very simple reason that it's often the default recommendation by economists because they don't want to interfere with anything else. And I think by itself, it would be a terrible remedy. Why? You know, imagine what the implicit message when we say, okay, yeah, the problem is education, so we should just invest more in education. We're saying, let's leave the direction of technological change exactly as it is. And let's just try to give more training and more education to workers. First of all, you know, all that would do is exactly the composition effects that Eric was worried about, that will sort of give degrees to more people. But if there aren't jobs, in which humans have high productivity, we're not investing in those, what good that's going to do. Second, you know, it's really that humans have very diverse skills. It's not that all humans are, you know, should be trained to become app programmers or app designers. You know, it is, I think, a better solution to try to find a happy medium between what skills humans have and what the direction of technological change is. So yes, we need some training, but also we need technology to become better match to the skills that different people have. And that doesn't mean that we have to make everybody into you know, software engineers. So I think it is a much more complex thing and just saying, oh, let the future of technology be decided by the private sector, read Facebook and Google or Netflix, a couple of companies, and then we do whatever we can with education and training policy. I think that is not the right solution. Are they are they compliments though, or, or substitutes? If, if yeah, they are compliments. If we do it yeah. right, they are compliments. But but I think the the leg of redirecting technological change has to be part of the equation. But but I mean specifically. Having more educated workers, would that lead to more technology that uses educated workers? That is my view. Yes, that is my view. That is my evidence. But it's also different in the sense that I think finding the right way of workers with different skills to be augmented by AI would require those workers to have some bridging skills. So if you if your skills and your interests make you an ideal landscaper, I don't think we should be training you not to be a landscaper and get landscaping done by a robot, but we should find a way of you benefiting from the wealth of information about landscaping that exists on the internet. So you need to have some fluidity, some flexibility to be adaptable and some way of using new technologies, but Still, there are a variety of skills related to your interest, dexterity, physical and mental work that are combined in a specific way for landscaping. David Tim has asked about the international aspect of, of, of that. Um, how, he asked about Professor Asimoglu, how we as a society manage to reskill millions of people around the world that will lose their jobs due to automation and also the health and climate oh, related. Thank you very much for raising this. And I, I, it is because I am a short, I was short of time and I was presuming that I was speaking to a US audience, but I actually think the problem is much, much worse. And the problem is much, much worse because these technologies are not for the US, they are for the world. And AI, in my opinion, if it goes in the automation direction would be the mother of all inappropriate technology. So by inappropriate technology, I use it in exactly the way that economists such as Francis Stewart and others introduced it in the 1960s, which is technologies that are imported and used in developing countries that are mismatched to their factors. So if you look at the developing world, still what they are rich in is human resources and what they are poor in is technological capability and capital. So in every 
developing country that has grown successfully has done so by using its human resources. Mm -hmm. So if we introduce technologies that replace labor, especially replaces labor that are not at the forefront of postgraduate education, you know, that is going to be a huge cost to the developing world. Mm -hmm. So if we take, if we put even a small weight on the workers of the developing world, my arguments are significantly strengthened. But in fact, I think they are true even if you ignore them. So for instance, if, if robots make it harder for uh, developing countries to, to climb up the ladder by having manufacturing jobs. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we're almost out of time. Let me talk a little bit about the, the, the politics of this. Sam Guckenheimer asks, um, how do you manage the political risk of a backlash that like Reagan's welfare queen speeches and government is the problem means? And, and I'll, I'll give you a license if you want to tie it into your, in the redirecting AI book, you mentioned that it's not just an economic issue, it's also AI affecting our, our information or misinformation and, and, and politics as well. So that, that makes it a more complicated problem. Absolutely, no, I mean, I, I, I don't have a full, a good answer to that, I'm sorry. It is, it, is, is a, it is a danger. I mean, you know, of course, some of that was brilliant marketing by Reagan and Thatcher, but it, 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 it was also because there were obvious inefficiencies of the welfare state that had, were becoming apparent. So redesigning the institutions of welfare state, uh, putting more emphasis in places where really the government intervention is needed is, is helpful. But most importantly, as Eric said, you know, I did paint in the spirit of being optimistic, a very positive picture of, yes, we can do this, but it is actually much worse perhaps in some dimensions because you know, we are seeing that AI and digital technologies are also weakening democracy in two very distinct but serious, serious ways. One of them is that they have changed the balance of power between state and society. Corporations that often align with the state uh, as the Edward Snowden revelations showed, and the state has much greater powers of monitoring and surveillance that really changes the balance between state and society. And second, as we have seen with Cambridge Analytica and everything else that has followed, you know, uh, AI powered algorithms are also fueling misinformation and making democratic discourse harder. So if democracy as the sort of the red queen effect of the last chart that I showed, is one obvious remedy for correcting the ills of misaligned direction of technological change. Well, we've just made that corrective force much weaker. So yes, again, we have a situation of a virtual vicious circle, perhaps. I'm not that pessimistic, but certainly, uh, <clears throat> you know, how to overcome the, uh, the challenges of democratic discourse in the age of AI is something that requires thought as well, which I did not get into because of shortage of time. Well, let me give you an opportunity to be more optimistic. You don't have to take it. it some of the folks in the Biden administration argue that, um, that if, if we act aggressively, that we will, to, particularly to help some of the people who've been left behind by automation, they're less likely to turn to some of the the uh, alternative solutions that, that didn't work out so well in the past decade and that we're acting aggressively with a, with well, a set of these solutions is less likely to lead us on that path. I, am, I think there is, there is some truth to that, uh, but obviously it's slow. You know, we see that, you know, uh, the, the Obamacare was also helping some of the people in exactly in one of the dimensions that was most corrosive, increasing uncertainty and security and healthcare costs. But, but that doesn't immediately translate into pulling back from conspiracy theories or, 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 or counter attitudinal sort of uh, reactions to the state's uh, interventions. So, so I think it will take time for the remedies that you just mentioned. And I think fixing the nature of political discourse, recreating some sort of protected space for democratic discourse, I think those are all ideas that we also have to consider in that context. Well, thanks, Arun. I wish we had more time to uh, continue this discussion. It's absolutely fascinating. I encourage folks to, to read the, the new book that just came out from the Boston Review where Daron has the lead essay on redirecting AI. Um, I have an essay in there as well as a Rob Reich and a number of other people basically reacting to, to Daron laying out what he talked about today in more detail and, and with more, uh, more facts and figures. So 
take a look at that. And of course, his uh, website has uh, dozens of other related papers where you can read it. I think we'll put them on our website as well, so you can uh, you can link to them. Thank you so much, Sharon. It's been an absolute pleasure, and we uh, you got a lot from hearing from you. I, I just uh, I wish we had more time, but we'll get you back another time. I wish I, we had more time too. This was a great conversation. Thank Absolutely you for great. organizing it, Eric, and thanks for everybody for being here and for the excellent questions and comments. And with that, we wrap up our uh, digital economy lunch seminar series for the spring. Uh, couldn't think of a more fitting way to end it. Uh, thanks very much. And we'll be announcing the schedule uh, in a month or so for the fall. Thanks, everyone. And I'm glad you could all join us. And thanks again to you, Jerome.